Welcome everyone to this panel for the Bodies and Boundaries and the Gothic session. And today we'll have four presenters. The first one will be Paula Granda with Loving and Hating, the Chuck Chair Tree, the Grotesque and Its Duality in Toni Morrison's Beloved. Paula is an independent scholar. She's an English teacher in Spain and her research interests focus on North American literature in its aesthetics and techniques, in particular studying the use of experimental modernist aesthetics in Faulkner and how other authors use these techniques. She also works on contemporary African-American female writers such as Toni Morrison and Jasmine Ward. I'll leave the floor to you, Paula. Thank you very much. I'm gonna start sharing. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. And thank you to the committee for showing interest in my proposal and also for um, answering to my uh, time requirements. Thank you. So in this talk, I wish to explore uh, the grotesque aesthetics present in Morrison's novel Beloved. I'm interested in its uh, double meaning as both a reminder of the pain and trauma and the suffering brought about by slavery and also as a trigger for the process of the memory which allows characters to heal in this novel. Mm, let us begin with a, a quick approach to the term itself, grotesque, uh, deriving from Italian grotta caves. Um, it initially denotes this kind of decorative ornament consisting in medallions and, and foliage, pebbles and so on, vegetable elements, uh, vegetation elements, sorry. It has also been used to describe architectural embellishments such as uh, gargoyles in places such as Gothic cathedrals. Then it was used around 16th century France in a literary context to talk about Rabelais um, and his emphasis on the body, which we will mention again regarding Bakhtin's use of Rabelais as an example of grotesque realism. Um, uh, in, in, in the 18th century, in the neoclassical period, it was used to denote the ridiculous, the bizarre, the extravagant or freakish, so in basically aberrations from the desirable norms of harmony and balance and proportion, and in art it's used for um, comic sardonic or exaggerated satirical effects, and in a similar way we can say that in a literary work the grotesque is just for this sort of satirical or comic purposes. Uh, and it is found in parody, satire, black comedy, the macabre and so on. So less in a comic uh, way, less as a comical relief than as a potentially positive aspect is how I see it in, in Morrison's Beloved as pointing at the wound, but also at the healing possibility in the wound. Um, let us have a look at the presence of the grotesque in Southern fiction. According to David Ponto, Southern Gothic appropriates elements of the traditional Gothic and combines them with um, particular concerns of the American South. And it is characterized by this emphasis on the grotesque, uh, the macabre and the violent very often. So such Gothic elements uh, may well be the grotesque as Ponto says, um, and also the uncanny intimately connected to it. So if we take the uncanny as the familiar, uh, sort of turned unfamiliar. Um, the grotesque in literature may show this duality as well. It is uh, the familiar, but it is exaggerated or distorted in some way, more shocking in some way or other, um, usually in a visceral way. Um, Morrison herself points at this um, duality in American literature itself in Playing in the Dark, uh, where she defended the need to acknowledge um, an uncanny non-white Africanist presence in, which haunts, she says, American literature. Furthermore, she comments on the paradoxical foundation of the states as a country itself, um, based like stemming from enlightened ideals and values of freedom and independence and reason, which was uh, nonetheless able to accommodate slavery as an economical system on which to build um, not just wealth, but the country itself. And uh, Theresa Godu concurs with this uh, presence of this duality in, at the very beginning of her Gothic America, writing that, quote, identified with Gothic doom and gloom, the American South serves as the nation's other, um, becoming the repository for everything from which the nation wishes to dissociate itself. So it is in the South where this 
um, irrational impulses, so to say, of the Gothic can happen. And the nation as a whole, which was born out of Enlightenment ideals, cannot um, act upon. And um, Gothic, uh, Southern Gothic fiction master Flannery O'Connor argues in this essay of hers, some aspects of the grotesque in Southern fiction, that um, a writer of uh, grotesque fiction looks for an image to connect two points, one in the concrete, uh, another not visible to the naked eye, but believed in by the author. So we find again this duality, which I see more as a complementation than a contradiction. This is what I will argue later on. She claims that the look of this fiction is going to be wild, almost of necessity, going to be violent and comic because of the discrepancies that it seeks to combine. And when asked about um, why Southern writers have this tendency to rise about freaks, she says that it is because they are able to recognize one. And so as to be able to recognize a freak, one needs to have some conception of the whole man. And in the South, the general conception, she argues, is still in the main theological. So uh, O'Connor dealt with salvation through the shocking and the violent actions of grotesque characters, both inside and outside. Um, so physically or morally grotesque or, or both. But I believe that Morrison is using the grotesque in, a, in another way, not pointing towards this um, salvation in a religious sense, but um, healing in a deeply human sense, like overcoming trauma without denying it. Um, and let's have a look at uh, Bakhtin's ideas on the grotesque before going on to see the, the textual evidence to conclude. He elaborates on, on, on it, on the grotesque, in his work Rabelais and his world, where he also explored the carnival and grotesque realism, which we will briefly mention later on. The latter refers to some of the qualities that Bakhtin attributed to Rabelais' writings, particularly this emphasis on the material and the bodily elements, which is key for his conception of the grotesque. Um, as Simon Dentis puts it, quote, Rabelais is famous, after all, as a writer who celebrates the body which eats, digests, uh, copulates and defecates, but who does so in a wild, exaggerated and grotesque way. In Bakhtin's own words, the essential principle of grotesque realism is degradation, that is the lowering of uh, all that is high, spiritual, ideal, abstract, transferring it to the material level, to the sphere of earth and body and their unity. Um, so this degradation is a precondition for rebirth and renewal uh, for, for Bakhtin. He believes that it digs a bodily grave for a new birth. Uh, it has not only a destructive negative aspect, but also a regenerating one. So degrading for Bakhtin is not uh, merely destroying, it is lowering to the reproductive uh, lower stratum. And that is an always conceiving area, according to him. So I here suggest, as Morrison seems to be doing uh, in her novel, the need for this synthesis. So the acknowledgement of the wrongdoings and the humiliation and the violation of rights and, and, and bodies uh, uh, caused by slavery, but also um, these acknowledgements so as to heal. And this is needed for what she calls rememory again. And this is the process that Bilot's main characters uh, go through so as to move on and heal. And Bakhtin's conception of the grotesque here, because of his interest um, and his emphasis on the body seems fitting, regardless of its um, excessive positivity or naivete, because he has been criticized, his conception of the grotesques has been criticized because of this, and I think it's worth mentioning it, but I think it seems fitting because of the interest of, um, on, the, of the, interest on the body. Um, let us focus on four characters. I wish we could focus on more because they are all very interesting, but we don't have time for more than four. Uh, let us begin with Baby Socks. Um, she emphasizes on the body in her group prayers after she was freed. She started acting as a preacher of some sorts, um, an unchurched preacher, as Morrison puts it. And um, she gathered people in the clearing and encouraged them to love themselves, to celebrate themselves and their bodies and to love their flesh. Uh, let your mothers laugh, let your wives and your children see you dance. It started that way, laughing children, dancing men, crying women, and then it got mixed up. So in her preaching, she mentions the flesh, the flesh that weeps, that laughs. Uh, she says that yonder, so the, the slave owner, they abuse the bodies, the skin on their back, the hands which they use, tie, bind, chop off. 
and she encourages her flock to love their hands, uh, their mouths, their flesh. And then she goes on to talk about the, the inside body. So this connects to Bactinian's open body and inside body. Uh, she tells them to, do, to love their dark, dark liver and the beat, beating heart. Um, notice her, her mentioning of laughter, which Bakhtin takes as a subversive exercise of defiance against the established authority, and the mention of the dancing as a festive activity, which could be connected to the carnival again. Um, yet above all, it is interesting, this emphasis on the material body and the inside body, the inside organs even. Um, many of the characters in Beloved have uh, physical scars, deformities or disabilities caused by slavery. Uh, Baby Sucks has a limp herself, uh, Seth's wet nurse was missing half an arm, um, Poldy has a scar around his neck, uh, which he calls his uh, neck jewelry, and Seth has this huge scar on her back. This is a choke cherry tree. Um, as I said, it is the duality that interests me. Uh, the most, and most of these physical manifestations of pain and trauma also show a potential for regeneration in some way, or rebirth, or healing. Uh, Seth's scar is a painful reminder of slavery indeed, and not only in general, but in particular um, of the violation that she wanted to denounce and she told. And as a punishment, this is what caused her back skin to quote unquote, buckle like a washboard, as the novel says. Uh, the episode she wanted to denounce was that she was, uh, her milk was stolen. She was pregnant with Denver at the time and uh, uh, school teacher's nephews stole it from her, sucking it out of her breasts. And in the meantime, school teacher was just uh, looking and taking notes. Um, Meiji Henderson refers to this as a um, grotesque party of the Madonna and child, Seth's milk like her labor and the fruits of her womb is expropriated. So on the one hand, Seth's scar is this, a painful reminder, yet on the other, it is the possibility for rebirth. Uh, the fact that it is a tree suggests life, and this description that Amy Denver gives of it is filled with life. Amy Denver is the white girl that helps Seth across the river to freedom, and she also helps her assist her in giving birth to Denver, hence uh, the name. And she says this of Seth's scar, she says that it is a tree, that it is wide open, full of sap, that there are blossoms and that the tree, uh, the, 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 the blossoms, the, the flowers are in bloom. And all these images suggest uh, life and, and rebirth. And the fact that she shares this with Paul D, with the male character, allows for the healing process to begin, uh, more or less. Part of this rememory process consists precisely in that, in the, the sharing of the story, the putting it together, as we will see. And Paul, D, Paul D's reaction to the scar represents this duality of the grotesque and the uncanny again. So at first he feels this deep empathy and tenderness and connection with Seth's pain. He rubbed his cheek on her back and talks about the scar in terms of the tree again. So life, the roots, the, the trunk, the intricate branches and refers to it as a sculpture, a decorative work and wishes to touch every region, live of it with his mouth. But then when they go upstairs, they're getting ready to have sex, he suddenly feels this deep rejection and even disgust uh, towards the scar. It is now a revolting clump of scars, and nothing like a tree he knew. And um, I would like to uh, finish by commenting on Beloved, the character, who is also a clear embodiment of the grotesque. She appears uh, right after Paul D. Denver and Seth go to a carnival, which is also interesting. Um, because Bakhtin's notion of the carnival includes this idea of altering the established order. So it is a, quote, temporary liberation from the prevailing truth and established order, unquote. And uh, the moment um, which Beloved appears serves as a foreshadowing element of what she will come to symbolize. Uh, Susan Corey claims, quote, she represents the eruption of the uncanny, the anti-rational or the mythic into the realm of normal existence, an event that may unlock previously locked emotions and open the mind to a wider experience of life, unquote. This is exactly what happens. Um, Beloved opens uh, Paul D's tin can, which is uh, the hidden place where he had been putting all his feelings and emotions and traumas, and she bursts it open. Um, she blurs the line between the living and dead, present and past and so on. And we can appreciate here Morrison's interest in the effect of the past and particularly the traumatic past in people's presence. 
Right after seeing her, Settler experiences this sudden urge to urinate, which she does right there in the open. Um, and this action also connects with Bakhtin's open body, the body that eats, defecates and gives birth. Paul is attracted and repelled by Beloved. Uh, he cannot help sleeping with her. She urges him to, to touch her in the inside part, again, inside, inner body. And um, when he comes back uh, uh, to, to, to the house after leaving for a while, uh, when Setha and, and Beloved have been alone for a while, um, the decoration of the house, the house is filled with um, vegetal elements and, and, and some weeds that have been growing. And it looks like the grotesque uh, decoration that the original uh, definition of grotesque uh, suggests. So as we have seen, and as a conclusion, I would like to reiterate on the message that Morrison seems to be suggesting by the end of her work. Um, Setha, Paul D are together. He thinks about her back and his neck jewelry, the scars that he bears. And he believes that no other woman would have reacted to them the way that she did, uh, leaving her uh, his manhood intact and reassuring him. And he wants to put his story next to hers. So they both have a lot of yesterday, he says. Uh, this means they both suffered this trauma of slavery, yet with this tenderness and balance and careful revisiting of the trauma um, and rememory process, this may lead to healing and moving on. The final words of the novel point at, at the duality in the grotesques present in the novel. This is not a story to pass on, the novel says. Neither should one ignore it and hence not tell it, uh, nor should uh, it be said because it is unspeakable. So these horrors are uh, so traumatic that they are both unspeakable and it is necessary to, to talk about them, to heal. Um, I would like to conclude with Michael Wester's quote, uh, Black literary Gothic significantly rewrites the notion of the uncanny in Black literature, revelation and recognition of the dark secret proves vital to progress. So this is a remembery process and I think that the tests in, the, in this story uh, embody this duality. And this is it. Thank you very much. This is uh, work sizes, and um, and that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. It was a very very interesting presentation, and uh, um, we can just uh, move on to the next speaker. That will be Kirsty Wara with. Uh, her presentation uh, is when the fox hears the rabbit scream, how zoomorphism contributes to gothic excess in Hannibal. And Kirst is program leader for film studies, media studies and music at Shrewsbury College's group, Shropshire, UK. She's also co-host of the horror podcast. And now the podcast starts. Her research interests include horror, science fiction, gender, celebrity, and fan cultures. And the floor is yours, Kirsty. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Kirsty. Um, I'm going to be talking today about um, how Brian Fuller's television interpretation of Tar Thomas Harris's Hannibal Lecter novels employs zoomorphism using animal metaphors and imagery to heighten the emotional conflict of the piece in a way that elevates its gothicness. Um, so if I just move on to my first slide. Um, so in Monstrous Masculinities in Gothic Romance, Evan Hales Gledhill argues strongly for Hannibal as a gothic text suggesting that it is both marketed and consumed as such. They contend that, quote, Hannibal enters a dialogue with this genre's traditions. In all these stories, the creators develop a great deal of sympathy for their monstrous characters, while the audience is encouraged to explore and understand the motives of both the monster and their victims, end quote. The lexicon of Hannibal frames monstrosity as predatory and bestial references, both real and mythic, are found within the mise-en-scene and in the dialogue. Hannibal's monsters are located within Western classical traditions, so I'm going to highlight a little bit of how this discourse evolves over Hannibal's three seasons, focusing mainly on the principal characters um, in the show. The consistent zoomorphin, zoomorphism even, is in keeping with the gothic excesses um, of the show as a whole. But before I talk about Hannibal's representational ecosystem, it's necessary to acknowledge the root of what Steve Baker describes as, quote, totemic practice, end quote. 
Cultures share semiotic frames of animal reference and our understanding is underpinned by the symbolism gleaned uh, in early childhood through narratives such as folk tales and fables. And these archetypes have become more or less fixed in Western cultures. Dogs are loyal, foxes are cun cunning, owls are wise, etc. Western authors can encode meaning with a confident expectation that a similar audience will access the preferred reading. So in the first episode, Hannibal describes gifted profiler protagonist Will Graham as, quote, the mongoose I want under the house while the snakes slither by, end quote. The mongoose is not an, uh, an indigenous animal in the UK, and I confess initially I found that descriptor kind of curious. Um, but quick search revealed the mongoose to be an, an omnivorous predator, and so with that knowledge I could then decode the metaphor. Hannibal implies that he is the master of the house who allows Will's presence because of his usefulness and the snakes are the killers that he catches. In this trinity of symbols, Hannibal perceives himself as significantly more dominant than both Will and the other killers, revealing his superiority complex. In his very first dialogue scene, Lecter uses an animal metaphor to characterize the paranoia of a client. The first symbolic connection to a lion is made with some dramatic irony because of, because of the significant cultural capital of Hannibal Lecter. The spectator knows that there is a dangerous predator in the room, but the client doesn't, at least not yet. Hannibal's zoomorphic discourse, though, doesn't always anchor the cannibal to predators. The stag is connected to him early on through the prominent placement of a sculpture in his office. The stag is emblematic of masculine strength, pride, and of a successful hunt. And it's really easy to expand that into an allegory for the relationship between Will and Hannibal as the hunter and the hunted, a rather expected dynamic for a procedural text. But a more monstrous sigil for Hannibal also echoes the stag. The Wendigo is a sinewy man with impressive antlers. He's a dream symbol for Hannibal in Will's mind. And it's, he's clearly communicative of Hannibal's more abhorrent nature. Some consideration though of the mythology of the Wendigo is needed to understand why it's such a suitable symbol. Originating in Native American folklore, a Wendigo is a human possessed by a demon following an act of cannibalism. Hannibal's Wendigo is human form, naked, often with elongated hands, cloven hooves and pitch coloured skin. And these characteristics are designed to make him more monstrous. Um, that draws on Christi Christian folkloric traditions of devils and indeed the devil. And then in season three, those Christian um, uh, mythology associations in relation to Lecter are really made more, much more prominent. Hannibal also favours, as part of its overall discourse, a kind of human pig cipher, so that as Samantha McLaren observes, quote, we see the body being dehumanised and, in this case, recast as an animal body. Since pigs represent baseness and boorishness, the rudeness Lecter perceives in his victims lowers them to his stratum, to this stratum in his eyes, and he treats them accordingly, end quote. Pig mogul Mason Verger, whose rudeness in season two is punished by Lecter, pursues physical zoomorphic revenge. Hannibal notes in Digestivo that, quote, it's very important to Mason that I have the pig's experience, end quote. Given the frequent reminders of Lecter's superiority complex and the reinforcement that he sees his victims as pigs, we are positioned to appreciate what an indignity this must be for him. We move on now to talk about the raven stag, which is one of the most anemic totems in Hannibal. It's a creature that is formed through symbolic conjoining. And the viewer is invited to combine their knowledge of the constituent animals to form an understanding of it. It first appears in the very first episode and it's presented as an ambiguous emblem. A large black stag appears in a night nighttime woodland, incongruously just beyond the shower curtain, as if it's approaching Will's subconscious mind. The creature looks conventional, but closer inspection reveals its body to be feathered. This introduction happens after Will attends his first Chesapeake Ripper crime scene, and it's this which motivates this, the creation of this subconscious signifier. Ravens are shooed away from the body of Cassie Boyle, and she's aesthetically arranged atop a dead stag. The combination of the animalistic elements feeds our perception of the Ripper, of the Ripper, who is Lecter, and through the raven stag, he is romanticized and mythologized. The raven is an icon of death in the Gothic. 
the symbolic associations of the stag as a symbol of masculinity and of the hunt are also present, but are now juxtaposed and fused with the macabre raven. Curiously, though, the raven stag is not an inherently disturbing or overtly evil um, when it appears in the show. It's initially symbolic of Hannibal in Will's mind, and it, but knowing that empowers the decoding of specific moments which might otherwise seem confusing. For example, in Coquille, Will is shown sleep walking and the raven stag nudges him from behind, suggesting Hannibal's man manipulation of Will. In Nakachoko, the raven stag crashes through Will's window in place of Van Voltier, cementing the idea that Tyr is acting under Hannibal's influence. Brian Fuller, though, offers a slightly different intention of its meaning, explaining that it, quote, represented the, the connection between Will Graham and Hannibal Le Lecter, end quote. With this in mind, the creature's death at the end of season two, repeated with bloody gusto at the beginning of season three, signals the death of their friendship, motivated by Hannibal's discovery of Will's betrayal. Furthermore, Hannibal's broken heart, the grim murder tableau constructed from Anthony Dimmon's course in Primavera, transforms for Will into a gruesome reanimated stag monster, following Will's realization that the heart is actually a message from Hannibal for him. And the abject resurrection suggests that their relationship is actually far from over. When we first meet Will, he's characterized rather sympathetically. Um, and that characterization hinges on the comfort that he finds with his canine family. In Futamono, Alana Bloom illustrates this. Quote, I look at these dogs and I see the best part of Will, end quote. And of course, dogs are associated with fidelity, with trust, with protection. And through reinforcing his relationship to his dogs, we understand that Will also has these positive qualities. In Potage, Hannibal suggests that Will is also like a bloodhound, emphasizing his professional purpose. He tracks killers for Jack Crawford at the FBI's uh, Behavioral Science Unit. The theme of transformation in Hannibal dominates the series and Will becomes increasingly aware of his own need to change in season two. Visually, this idea is manifested through sequences which depict Will growing antlers or being reborn as something physically more monstrous. These moments of body horror convey the idea that Will is becoming like Hannibal and the connotations of the raven stag and the wendigo are transferred to him. Samantha McLaren acknowledges that such moments are, quote, entirely characteristic of the transformations Gothic bodies often undergo, end quote. And Hales Gledhill also frames Will's metamorphosis as generic, calling the series, quote, a sensational Gothic romance that repeatedly suggests that Will's identity as an individual is being subsumed into his relationship with Lecter, end quote. In the penultimate episode of season three, Hannibal taunts Jack with questions over Will's motivations and actions and using zoomorphic metaphor, quote, the lamb is becoming a lion, end quote. The lamb is of course a very well established symbol of innocence and goodness and, and is a symbol for Christ. But the lion also come, calls back to the lion metaphor from the first episode. Hannibal is suggesting that Will is becoming more monstrous, more like him. And of course, lamb has metatextual potency too, as a connection is being invited with the most iconic lecture property, the silence of the lambs. And in the final episode, well, the title of the final episode, rather, The Wrath of the Lamb, further develops that link between Will and this polysemic animal, suggesting a fury that relies a benign exterior. And the episode climaxes with Will and Hannibal in vicious combat with the red dragon, Francis Dollarhide. And in this sequence, Will and Hannibal are represented as highly bestial and equally deadly, like lions taking down bigger prey. And after Will's admission that, quote, it's beautiful, end quote, suggests his final adoption of Hannibal's pers perspective, reinforcing that unity. Of course, this paper wouldn't quite be complete without mention of the regularly featured discussion of Hannibal's cuisine in the show. There are many frequent tongue-in-cheek descriptions of his food, and these moments have become affectionately known as Langley implied cannibalism in the fandom. Andrew Owen and Leanne Havis acknowledge that, that Hannibal, quote, is a purveyor of the language of the anthropomorphic innuendo. He delights in revealing to his dinner guests precisely the nature of the dishes that he serves, end quote. Some augmentation of this assessment is needed, though. To Hannibal's unsuspecting dinner guests, his descriptions are anthropomorphic, but to the spectator, we may decode them as zoomorphic if we assume the meat is people. 
thus dramatic irony is created and the inclusion of these innuendos helped to create perverse allegiance with the cannibal. So whilst I've only skimmed at the surface here, the analysis of bestial discourse offers a really interesting roadmap for character development and relationships and theme in Hannibal as Gothic text. The hunt of prey dynamic seems an obvious one to use given the procedural elements, but it's not employed in a wholly generic way. The zoomorphism feeds the Gothic identity of Hannibal, offering food for thought about humanity's place in the natural world and our capacity for monstrosity. And yes, I did intend those puns. Um, Viewing the, the series through such a lens frames the horror as more beguiling as the viewer is positioned to understand that, like Lecter, predation and consumption are naturally just and possibly aesthetically and spiritually enrich, enriching too. The anchoring of, of his ideas within a cathartic code predicated on escapist moral reevaluation has resulted in a really complex and often romantic Gothic fascination with the cannibal as shown by transformative works on platforms such as Tumblr. Drawing on the works of Murray Smith and Aaron Taylor around responses to the character, I explore this relationship in more detail in a chapter in Hannibal for Dinner. Understanding why the use of animals, ah, I knew I was gonna do that, animal, animal symbols um, is so effectively employed uh, in Hannibal is illustrated further when we think about the show's Gothic identity. Martin Kemp explains in The Human Animal in Western Art and Science that the iconic Gothic authors used their works to, quote, bear witness to the thinness of civilized skin that holds back humans from animalistic behavior, end quote. And similarly, McLaren argues that Hannibal challenges that skin and other binaries too, quote, as the border between human and animal bodies breaks down, so too do the other borders between interior and exterior, between self and other, end quote. So perhaps Thomas Harris's Cannibal, centered and developed in Brown Fuller's adaptation is powerful because it asks if one can be civilized and cultured and animalistic too. So here are the references um, for this paper today. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for listening. I'm really grateful to have been um, invited to participate in this panel. Perfect, thank you. Perfect on time. <laughs> I have to say, and uh, now we can move on to our next speaker, and it's going to be Igor Yuricevic. Uh, with seeing the abject visual metaphor evidence from Batman Detective Comics versus Superman Action Comics. Igor is an associate professor at Indiana University South Bend and the founder editor of the journal of Cognition and Diversity. Their current research focuses on metaphoric picture perception, especially in comic art pioneering the approach outlined by the corpus analysis relevance theory, allowing analysis of comic art to eliminate cognitive processing. And the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. So as, um, as was introduced, this is uh, seeing the object Visual metaphor evidence uh, from Batman Detective Comics uh, versus Superman in Action Comics. So um, in terms of uh, seeing the object, we're gonna work with, there we go. In terms of seeing the object, uh, we're gonna start off with a working definition of uh, what we're going to uh, use uh, to define the object. After that, I'll introduce uh, a visual metaphor uh, called close-up eye asymmetry um, that could potentially communicate the object uh, in comic and visual media. Then uh, we'll tackle the issue of whether Batman is actually more gothic than Superman, and spoiler alert, uh, he is. But then we'll see if um, close-up eye asymmetry is actually used to depict gothic ideas like the, obje uh, like the object, and taking a look in whether Batman actually is depicted more using this visual metaphor than Superman is in their history of uh, being portrayed in the comics. All right, so for the abject, the working definition uh, we'll use um, is the idea that the abject refers to entities um, that are degraded, despicable, and importantly required to be excluded. There's something that needs to be uh, cast out. And part of the reason why they need to be excluded is this idea that they 
uh, threaten meaning from this loss of the distinction between the self and other. So we just saw a talk about the loss of sort of the distinction between uh, human and animal. This is the loss of distinction between um, the self and things that are outside of the self, who you are and things that are separate from you. But much like uh, many things in, in uh, Gothic uh, uh, storytelling, it holds, uh, the object holds this inescapable fascination, this idea that we just can't look away. So we're curious and at the same time we're repulsed. So we're gonna be using that kind of idea of this dual nature of the object, the idea that the object is both um, something that makes you curious and also something that repulses you at the same time. And the idea that the object uh, loses this distinction uh, between the self and the other, it communicates this idea of a loss of that borderline between uh, self and others. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on uh, in our look at uh, the object. Uh, now we're gonna introduce the idea of close-up eye asymmetry or QA. And this came about from research that I did on um, the development of visual metaphors. And I actually traced this development of and use of QA back to the cover of David Bowie's Aladdin Sane, hence the image of the uh, founding father of this uh, metaphor. And the idea of close-up eye asymmetry it's a metaphor that combines two uh, visual grammars together. The first one is this close personal distance. So it's a photo or an image that is close up to the viewer and that communicates that the image depicted or the person depicted is like the viewer. So that would say that this, in this case, David Bowie is human rather than alien because he's close to us, he's human rather than alien. However, the asymmetry caused by the makeup lightning bolt uh, across his eye, this communicates that he is unlike the viewer because most, um, most things that occur in nature uh, have that bilateral symmetry. So asymmetry always communicates that idea that this entity is not like uh, a human. So that communicates the idea of alien rather than human. So this combination of close up and I asymmetry uh, can communicate that duality of something being both human and at the same time, something being alien, something that is like us and at the same time, something that is unlike us. In other words, it blurs that distinction between the self and other. And it has this sort of fascination with us. Um, the asymmetry actually causes a fascination leading to the curiosity, but at the same time, it's not something that we are comfortable with, and hence that feeling of um, a, a feeling of repulsion. So, in my previous analyses uh, of this metaphor in comic books, it is used um, extensively. Uh, oftentimes, it's used in the depiction of um, the uh, powers of the superheroes. So, I've given these examples here to show that this is something that is deliberately done. So, close-up eye asymmetry is something that is not necessarily um, caused because of um, certain powers. It's deliberately done by the, uh, by the artist. So Storm has weather powers, lightning powers, but her powers are not asymmetrical. So there's no reason for that lightning bolt to be coming out of her eye, only one eye. There's no reason for her hair to be swept only to the one side. Same thing with Magneto. There's no reason for that uh, light to be coming out of his one eye to symbolize his uh, magnetic powers or in the Harbinger, uh, Peter Stanchek, he has uh, psychic abilities. Again, it's not, it's not uh, asymmetrical by nature. So you can do it with depiction of powers. Importantly uh, for us, you can also do it with the layout of objects or lighting in the, uh, in the image. So you can do it uh, starting on the left of the Rocketeer. You can do it by light, uh, uh, lighting. Uh, the Joker in the middle, holding the camera in front of his eye rather than you know, across his face. Um, and then the skull could have been placed anywhere in this photo, but rather than placing it symmetrically, it's asymmetrically covering specifically the eye. And then you can also see it in uh, collage work or other types of artistic choices where symmetry was an option, but asymmetry was used. And again, this is the uh, technique that can be used to indicate that these characters while they're like us, while Hawkeye is like us, he is also unlike us. He's somewhat different 
And again, it gives you that feeling of uh, curiosity as well as that sort of uneasiness and uh, um, repulsion. So that's close up eye asymmetry. The next uh, issue is whether Batman is actually more Gothic than Superman, whether his um, conception, uh, conceptualization actually has more Gothic uh, components. So this is the uh, Superman v Batman portion of this talk. So um, we all know that Batman is more Gothic than Superman, but where's the fun in that? So let's take a look at some evidence for this. So one of the things that I did uh, for this analysis, well, I just Googled the term Batman Gothic and I Googled the term Superman Gothic. And as you can see, uh, Batman Gothic got about 19 million hits, while Superman Gothic surprisingly got 16 and a half million hits. So while Batman Gothic had more hits, it definitely wasn't the landslide victory that I thought it would be. But when you take a look at what those uh, hits actually were, for Batman, they were all stories. They were all from uh, official Batman stories um, that basically had that element of gothic um, storytelling to it, where for Superman, it was mostly uh, clothing, uh, logos on t-shirts and uh, other aspects of gothic clothing with very few actual uh, depictions of anything gothic coming from the comics uh, themselves. So that's one line of evidence from Google. Another one, uh, I'm going to uh, defer this to uh, Grant Morrison. So he has written stories both for uh, Superman and for Batman, highly critically acclaimed stories. And his all-star Superman, you can see there, there's hope, there's light. Uh, there's basically nothing gothic in this image whatsoever. But his most famous Batman story, the uh, Arkham Asylum, the serious house on serious earth, basically just has just about every gothic trope you could possibly put into one uh, story. And his understanding of these characters is that Superman is light, Superman is hope, Batman is gothic, this impending sense of uh, doom and, uh, and unavailable or, or unable to uh, escape from the impending doom. Furthermore, uh, I took a look at uh, various internet um, polls in terms of which uh, covers are the most iconic covers for each character. And once again, you can see for the Superman iconic covers, his top five, very little of if any gothic elements whatsoever in any of those covers. But as soon as you go to Batman, you can see that it does turn the corner. So we have those gothic elements. We have uh, the elements of uh, death here. And there's a darkness to it and an impending sense of doom. And basically, once again, just about every gothic trope that you could potentially um, put into one image here. So we have the foreboding image of Batman. We have the cloudy, you know, castle in the sky. And this is the one, one of the covers that is actually most often homaged in uh, Batman uh, comics. So it was recreated multiple times across the year. Um, it's the demon of Gothos uh, Mansion. And um, you know, done by Alex Ross as well. Whereas the comics that are reproduced by Superman or uh, homage by Superman tend to again be the lighter, more uh, upbeat Superman comics. Um, just to kind of further put a nail into this uh, co <laughs> this uh, coffin here, Batman actually has a series, a limited series called Batman Gothic. Um, he comes from Gotham you know, which is basically just a play on that, uh, that phrase. So it is clear that Batman is, has many more Gothic elements than Superman uh, actually does. So uh, to kind of uh, uh, expand on this a little bit more, not only does Batman have more um, aspects of Gothic uh, kind of features, but he also has this confusion of the self and other. And he also has this idea of somebody who needs to be uh, cast out. Uh, basically, he is abject in the DC universe. So a great example of his confusion between the self and other came from the Wonder Woman annual where they took hold of the lasso of truth and she asked everybody to state their names. And uh, she came off in Diana Themyscira. Superman was like, I'm Clark Kent and Kal-El. And Batman is like, I'm Batman. Because his confusion between his two identities 
is such that he really is Batman and Bruce Wayne is the actual mask. And then also in uh, the JLA Tower of Babel, in terms of Batman needing to be outcast, uh, this is a scene where the members of the Justice League are meeting to determine whether or not they're going to vote out Batman from the Justice League, cast him out, and they actually uh, do. It end up uh, casting out Batman for the things that he did in that story. All right, so Batman is definitely more gothic uh, than Superman. So the last thing to take a look at is, well, does uh, is Batman depicted uh, using QA, using that close-up IA symmetry, more than Superman? And if he is, that would indicate that this is something that communicates that aspect of the object um, in a visual medium. So let's take a look at that. So for to do this analysis, what I basically did was I started off with comics from uh, January 1960. So there are the two comics uh, for Batman and for Superman. And I limited this to comics from Detective Comics and the uh, comics from Action Comics. And what I did was I took a look at how many times is Batman depicted using close-up asymmetry and how many times is Superman depicted using close-up asymmetry going from January 1960 all the way up to December of 1999. So every single time they were depicted using close-up asymmetry, I made a note of that. And if you graph that and further away from the midline is increasing use of close-up asymmetry. If you graph the use of close-up asymmetry across uh, this timeline, you can see that for Superman, close-up asymmetry is used. So there are instances in his comics where he does have close-up asymmetry. And I actually found 17 such instances However, when you take a look at Batman, close-up asymmetry is used far more for Batman, nearly double, and that's about 29 instances of close-up asymmetry. And for those of you who like statistics, this is actually significant, uh, a significant difference. So this is not due by chance. This is not due by some random flipping of the coin. Batman is truly depicted more often using close-up asymmetry than Superman is. So Batman actually is uh, depicted with close-up asymmetry uh, more than Superman. And given that Batman is gothic and Superman is not, this is good evidence that this close-up asymmetry is actually a visual device that does depict uh, the object and can be used for depicting that idea of losing the self and other and uh, that idea of curiosity and repulsion. So um, that is it for my presentation. I guess we're gonna get into insights and deep dives uh, after the third presentation, but I'd just like to uh, thank everybody uh, for listening and uh, making it out today. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was yet another very interesting presentation and uh, also perfect on time. So we can, uh, have our last presenter, and that is Farah Smith, with her presentation, Caregiving Subversion and the Female Disabled Body in Mary Wilkins Freeman's Luella Miller. Farah is a graduate student at CUNY Hunter College. Her main research interests focus on disability studies, Gothic and supernatural fiction, global decadence and symbolism, German romanticism, and women in the Middle Ages. Farah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Um, so I don't have a presentation in terms of PowerPoint. I'll be reading my essay. Uh, before I do that, I want to thank the committee and organizing committee for allowing me to present this um, and the panelists uh, for your wonderful presentations. OK, so I will start now. The disabled body has been othered since the Middle Ages and certainly earlier serving in literature as a representation of moral repugnance and a harbinger of death. Anxieties surrounding disparate bodies are amplified when examining disabled women who embody an intersectional otherness that illustrates disease and woman as a fragmentation of the male, a perspective that has been long held by philosophers dating as far back as Aristotle and as recently as Lacan. In Mary Wilkins Freeman's short story, Luella Miller, uh, the titular character is a frail, willowy woman who embodies a physical powerlessness that results in her complete reliance on those around her for survival. The people who help her, including her husband, 
die while doing so from exhaustion and possibly more that isn't specified. When no one agrees to help her anymore, she passes away herself. In multiple passages, the tale is indicative of vampiric lore, though it is never specifically stated that Miller is a vampire. The more compelling observation than that of vampirism is the parallels that can be drawn between Luella Miller and her caretakers, and those who care for disabled loved ones, loved ones in real life. Luella Miller may be a tale portraying the profound burden of taking care of a sickly individual and the so-called uh, and historically believed danger of proximity to one who is sick. Miller is depicted as a needy and remorseless invalid, conveying the moral repugnance often associated with the disabled in medieval and Gothic literature. This speaks to the idea in society that the disabled are lazy uh, and invalid and that their lives aren't valuable, particularly in Freeman's characterization of Miller as one who quits her job as a school teacher to be cared for. So through the use of contemporary discourses on disability futurity, uh, Freeman's Luella Miller can be framed and examined as a uh, tale uh, speaking against or for the caring of the sick and disabled, depending on the perspective, and I'll examine that. Um, so uh, the question must be raised regarding if through the lens of this disability scholarship, uh, is it a positive or negative narrative? So according to Carol George and D Judith Solomon's attachment and caregiving, the caregiving behavioral system, care, um, the term attachment has become a shorthand phrase for an enduring relationship that encompasses class, classes of observable behavior uh, that according to ethological theory are regulated by the attachment system. More readily discussed as a factor between parent and infant, attachment style is also discussed in terms of interpersonal relationships between adults through its broader application of psychological theory. While the character of Luella Miller is dependent on her caregivers, the question must be raised as to the, or as to the origins of this dependency. Her behavior is consistent with the concept of learned helplessness, which is an acquired sense of powerlessness that extends uh, specifically from trauma while there is little evidence to that effect in the text uh, regarding specificities of trauma, uh, there is one admission by a character, Maria Brown, who is one of her caregivers, who says that Miller is an abused person. Uh, and it may be proposed that rather than being a vampiric entity, Luella Miller could have been the subject of trauma, uh, undiagnosed physical disability or undiagnosed mental disability let, that led to her state of dependence on others. The social vilification of Luella Miller is immediately stated with the narrator's admission that she was, quote, an evil name in the village, unquote. While described as beautiful, Miller's more curious aspects include being, quote, a slight, pliant sort of creature, unquote, and that her gait was as though, quote, one of them willows over there on the edge of the brook st could start up and get, it roots, get its roots free of, off the ground and move off it would go just the way Luella Miller used to, unquote. While her physicality immediately establishes her as a disparate body, um, there is still little to suggest that Miller has anything other than a passing pe uh, peculiarity of frame, which is in no way monstrous or indicative of disability. Uh, and while there are instances of Luella's uh, delineation of tasks that have vague suggestions of the supernatural, uh, this is beside the point in that even as a supernatural even with a supernatural underpinning to the tale, uh, there's the suggestion of the inhumanity of the disabled person because even a supernatural person is other. Um, the narrator for the majority of the tale is a character called Lydia Anderson. She is a voice of hostility and skepticism when it comes to Miller's uh, illness, veiled as concern for the caretakers themselves. Miller's inability to care for herself is framed as unwillingness. Anderson sees her as unproductive and selfish, someone who, quote, used to sit and cry and do nothing, unquote. Her lack of empathy is the same one finds in society today towards the disabled who are evaluated regarding their worth uh, in terms of productivity. According to Alison Kafer and the book Feminist Queer Crip, disability continues to be, uh, quote, disability continues to be primarily uh, seen as a personal problem afflicting individual people a problem best solved through the strength of character and resolve, unquote. Uh, Lydia Anderson's intuiting of wickedness aligns with the moral repugnance of often associated uh, with disabled characters historically in literature, as previously mentioned, um, flourishing very much in the medieval period. 
Uh, while, her, while Lydia Anderson's suspicions may be regarded as cleverness uh, in her own regard, is, it is also possible to characterize her view of Miller as a rejection of her as being worthy of caretaking, an ultimate denial of her vulnerability and the validity of disabled life. Anderson goes as far to say, quote, it seemed to her right that other folks that weren't any better able than she was herself should wait on her, and she couldn't get it through her head that anybody should think it wasn't right, unquote. And also, quote, she had killed so many better folks than she was and had just killed another that made me feel most as if I wish somebody would up and kill her before she had a chance to do any more harm, unquote. There are numerous instances of Anderson's denial of Miller's state, as well as a moment of abuse. She refers to Miller as a, quote, laughing, crying, and going on as if she were the center of all creation type being. All the time she was acting so, seemed as if she was too sick to sense anything. She was keeping a sharp lookout as to how we took it out of the corner of her eye. I see her. You could never cheat me about Luella Miller, unquote. She also states that she was a dreadful woman and that, uh, if she, quote, if she wasn't like a baby, the scissors in its hands cutting everybody without knowing she was doing it, unquote. Luella is often depicted as crying or going into hysterics. Her mental health is the only thing described with any degree of specificity in the tale. When Anderson accuses her of killing and says she is going to kill the doctor next, Miller's face flushes heavily. She was described as going into hysterics when uh, Aunt Abby Mixter's daughter accused her of ill gain. And when Anderson said, quote, you'll be left alone and you'll have to do it yourself and wait on yourself or do without things, unquote. After the death of Maria Brown, one of her caretakers, um, it was said, I always suspected there was something about those hysterics. Weak heart, weak heart fiddlesticks. There ain't nothing weak about that woman. She's got strength enough to hang uh, onto other folks until she kills them. Weak, it was my poor mother that was weak. This woman killed as sure as if she had taken a knife to them, unquote. According to RJV Montgomery's caregiving and the experience of subjective and objective burden, uh, quote, studies have shown that family members find caregiving to be burdensome and stressful, unquote. Miller's first caregivers, save for Lottie Anderson, are her family members. Those who perished while taking care of her uh, include Lottie Anderson, who did all of Miller's teaching on her behalf, her husband, Erastus Miller, who supposedly died of consumption, Miller's sister-in-law, Lily, who sewed for her, Aunt Abby Mixter, Maria Brown, Dr. Malcolm, and Sarah Jones. Their deaths share the same pattern. They fall into caring for Luella Miller and immediately fall ill, wasting away until they pass. Maria Brown is notable and she is in that she is the only subject who has a martyr-like perspective on her declining health. Quote, Maria didn't live long afterward. She began to fade away just the same in just the same fashion as the others had. Well, she was warned, but she acted real mad when folks said anything. She said Luella was a poor, abused woman, too delicate to help herself, and they'd ought to be ashamed. And if she died helping her, that couldn't help. If she died helping them that couldn't help themselves, she would, and she did, unquote. Um, as for the physical evidence of illness that Miller displays, she is described as getting paler and paler, having hysterics until she got tired, and that it wasn't long before folks began to say that Luella Miller was going into a, cline, a decline just the way her husband and caretakers did. The story concludes with a mysterious account from Mrs. Anderson in which she says, quote, she saw Luella Miller and Erastus Miller and Lily uh, and all the caregivers, et cetera. Um, and all, uh, let's see, hold on, all going out of the door and all but Luella shone white in the moonlight and they were all helping her along till she seemed to, to fly in their midst and then they all disappeared, unquote. It is notable that with this site, while ghoulish and dark, does not find Luella Miller's caregivers in any type of purgatorial torment or regret as might have been displayed in earlier Gothic literature or medieval literature. Uh, if one is to look at this moment through a supernatural lens, it may be said that the souls of her caregivers are bound to her forever, casting a negative tone to the event, which may be something seen in a uh, vampire-focused analysis. Um, but in this disability-focused analysis, I would say that um, the characters gave themselves willingly uh, for someone they loved and saw as valid. This can be perceived as positive or negative since portrayal of caregiving 
as a form of martyrdom, uh, martyrdom indicates a level of sacrifice that places a great burden on the psyche of the disabled. So in conclusion, uh, Luella Miller is written in such a way that she embodies an intersectional otherness in being a woman and someone with undiagnosed and mysterious ailments. Her experience mirrors, mirrors those of countless women whose suffering uh, is invalidated as hysterics and attention seeking. Though the story uses language on the surface that may lead one to think that it, is, uh, that, that it has ableist underpinnings, the reality is that when examining the story through a lens of disability scholarship, it advocates for the importance of disabled life with the willingness and persistence of her caretakers. Viewing the story as vampiric will bring about another conclusion just as valid in that context. The narrative structure allows for projection and multiple interpretations due to the unreliable uh, nature of the narrator. For the purpose of disability studies, Luella Miller by Mary Wilkins Freeman may be used as an example of the discriminatory hardship disabled women face, as well as the importance of caregiving despite its negative aspects. For those that would argue that death is too extreme a consequence, it is worth reminding that the literary history has long displayed the repugnance of associating with the sick and that these characters are willing to do so and go to these lengths, to the length of death, which shows the high value of uh, Luella Miller's life and the life of the disabled. Thank you. Thank you. That is uh, very interesting as well. And uh, Paula had to leave us and it's a pity because I think uh, there would have been uh, some connections uh, to, to debate, absolutely. Um, but now we can uh, move on to the Q&A session. Let's see if our public have some questions. And uh, while, while we wait for uh, the questions, I, I would um, say that I can see that uh, you all uh, talked about otherness as a conflict of the self in a way. And uh, all of your uh, texts were also about, I would say some ambivalence of the self, these characters that do have uh, uh, this doubleness or not very um, well-defined boundaries of the self. So as you were saying, this uh, Luella Miller, that she's supposedly both a vampire, either metaphorically or not, but at the same time, she's also um, the weak one, the ill one, the one that is uh, confined to bed and that needs caregiving. And at the same time, as you were talking, Igor, about Batman that doesn't even really know who he is. I mean, he's always like, uh, we don't really know if he's, if he's Batman, if he's Bruce Wayne, if he knows that he is not, that he does have an alter ego or if he doesn't even know himself, you know? And, uh, and also, of course, uh, well, I, I have to say, I am a big uh, Batman fan he's the only the only superhero that i like so um i have to say that it is gothic really in a way because uh i find that um it's a superhero that has a lot of internal conflict and uh, you really see that sometimes he is really not acting that legitimately i mean there's a lot of uh gray and sometimes black areas in Batman's uh, action. And I would say that also Kirsty um, talking about Hannibal and maybe um, Will in a way uh, that gets somehow lost, so his self gets lost uh, in his contact with, with Lecter. So it, I, if you just want to, to make a comment, uh, each one of you in the order, you presented ab about this, and then we just see if uh, anyone wants to ask you something specific. Okay, so I suppose it's me up first then. Uh, I, I, you know, the, the discussion, I kind of highlighted um, Evan, 
Hell's Glad Hill work on, there's a whole uh, collection of um, uh, essays in a book called Becoming about the idea of kind of metamorphosis and um, Evan's work really sort of focuses on, yeah, the kind of gothic identity and the kind of, yeah, the, the, the melding of identities and there's a lot of work around Hannibal about that, you know, relationship between the two characters and, and, and how um, they reflect each other um, in how they, you know, kind of, yeah, reflect and affect um, each other. Um, but there is certainly kind of one dominant person <laughs> within that relationship. I was really interested actually in Eagle's uh, kind of idea of the, the um, uh, classify asymmetry in lots of, um, in a sort of wider way, um, because of course, um, Mass Mickelson as, um, as Hannibal, a lot of his fans sort of point out how often he plays a character who has some, I mean, not Hannibal, strangely, but a lot of his characters, the chief and um, the character from Valhalla Rising and, um, uh, oh, no. yeah, it all have something wrong with his eye and people kind of go, why, why? <laughs> but I suppose it's because he's, you know, there's something about his physicality that communicates this kind of ethereal otherness that is really, you know, kind of, um, yeah, kind of dark and gothic, um, which is why I think he, you know, he's such a great choice for Hannibal, so. Yeah, I mean, just just to kind of build on that, that crossed my mind as soon as I saw, you know, Matt Nicholson up there, I was like, oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> so it definitely, um, it definitely does do that. I mean, there, there's, uh, there was a really interesting study that came out in 2019 where they actually did brain scans of um, people looking at uh, asymmetrical disfigured uh, faces. And it actually reduced uh, brain activity in the area that um, deals with empathy. So it actually makes that person to you feel more distant, right? Like you, you can't even, you, you identify with them less. There's j it just increases that amount of um, otherness. And then I also, I also found the human animal border um, kind of uh, work that you were doing and, and, and that idea uh, kind of fascinating because I didn't even notice um, between Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman. I mean, if you take a look at the Trinity of DC characters, uh, Superman is just a Superman. Wonder Woman is a Wonder Woman. They're still man, they're still woman. But Batman is that animal human kind of hybrid to just further kind of, you know, emphasize the fact that he is um on the outside and he is um the one that uh you know is is the most unlike everybody else and is is the is the most that is that does have that otherness so yeah just that um that idea of uh not being able to you know keep those boundaries and just you know it, it, it getting um those those boundaries getting broken down and um yeah it's it's just fascinating that these kind of visuals, while there's while there's no uh, story need for them, right? They're like like you were saying, there's nothing in Hannibal where they're like, oh, as a child he got a scar on his on his eye or anything like that. Still, the choice to cast Mads Mikkelsen has that added benefit. I mean, he's a great actor. I've loved him in everything he's ever done, but it adds that little bit, you know, extra to it. Just. Just the same way that, you know, when you draw Batman and he's in the shadows and the shadow comes across just one side of his face, it just makes it uh, clear without even having to write it that something different, something outside, something not like us. And just deep within you, you have that emotional reaction where you're kind of like, well, this is fascinating. But at the same time, you're like, this is a little dangerous, you know, and and that um, I mean, I love the idea that. Uh, um, it was in um, uh, one uh, version of uh, Batman's history that he brought Robin. If you take a look at Robin, Robin is basically, Robin should be Superman's sidekick, right? I mean, everything about him is light and happy and breezy and airy. And Batman brought him in because he had trouble saving a child because the child was afraid of him. And uh, that was made to balance him out, you know, balance out his presentation. But it's just those little, those little cues, you know, it's almost like, it's like a, um, a slow burn where you don't really understand why it is that you're not feeling very secure, but just those added little visual elements uh, all contribute to it. Do you think that Batman suffers from the fact that he's not a real superhuman? 
<laughs> I mean, the part of his uh, internal drama, the, his self uh, conflicting uh, questioning and always going back to his personal trauma that, uh, you know, I've always thought, no matter how much I like Batman, I, I do find that it's a, an interesting character to criticize. Uh, uh, I think, you know, okay, they killed his parents, but uh, that can be absolutely traumatic and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But is that really enough to make you a Batman? You know, uh, does it really justify, is it enough to justify that he goes batshit and builds a bat cave and, and does all that stuff, you know? So I, I, I don't know, sometimes I do wonder if part of this conflict also might be, of course, we don't know and we'll never know. And I doubt that uh, that was the original intent, but uh, might he also need to compensate the fact that he doesn't really have any superpower, you know? <laughs> He's just a rich man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I find, I find that, that that's a great suggestion because outside of, himself he's one of the most highly respected characters in uh you know in the dc canon so just about every superhero respects him he's kind of almost like a dark version of captain america you know whereas captain america does have the super soldier serum but he's way levels below where a lot of the other heroes are but yet he is the most respected one there i think the same thing with batman but he definitely has that inner turmoil where um that other heroes don't have. So he's often brooding in his back cave, wondering if it's all worth it. Um, if you go to online discussions, it's a regular occurrence where people criticize him for not using his billions of dollars to basically fund social programs to clean up Gotham City rather than going around, you know, punching people. But, um, you know, thank goodness he doesn't. Otherwise, we wouldn't uh, have the stories that we do. And, uh, out of the, I think, 400 billionaires in the world, nobody's tried Batman's technique yet, so maybe it does work. I mean, we don't have any empirical data on that yet, but he's definitely the one that I've seen questioned the most in terms of whether he's really doing anything. So Superman usually doesn't sit around going, I wonder if I'm doing Metropolis any good. I wonder if, you know, Wonder Woman doesn't really brood about whether her, you know, uh, abilities are, are making a difference but batman's always wondering about that and and just that it goes it goes back to that gothic idea of like it's inevitable like there's this inevitable terror i mean the revolving door at arkham asylum you go you come in you go out it's 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 inevitable you know you're going to see the joker again and there's no way to escape that terror it's just the way that it is yeah thank you uh farah you want to say something uh let's let's skip back before the vigilante. <laughs> sure, well, I'm just thinking in terms of linking the presentations, you have the animalistic, you have the alien, you have sickness, all these things bring about, it is very gothic, the, these things that make us afraid and link right back to death. Um, and it also goes back to what Igor says, these things all have, we have a sort of curiosity and a repulsion. And that's, you know, that is the Gothic. But I also had a, another comment about Igor's presentation because I recently saw uh, there was a study done about um, body uh, dysmorphic disorder. And they found that people with kind of a normal, uh, you know, who look kind of normal in terms of visuals will look at people's eyes and nose. And there's this very specific tracking. So they would track where the eyes were. And that people with um, body dysmorphia had this very disorganized um, way of looking at faces where there would be these very random and, and uh, inconsistent tracking, which I found, it, you know, it made me think of that because I'm thinking, um, you know, there's a lot of trauma and, and, you know, loss of empathy for the self in that disease. Um, and that, and I'm always thinking about in terms of how these things affect uh, disabilities and illness. So I found that very interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's, um, I would, I would love if you could um, somehow you know, send me the information for that study, because, um, yeah, I mean, my, my work is so focused on, on uh, the visuals and how they affect an individual, not how an individual affects uh, the visuals. But um, again, that's, I mean, 
we, we keep coming back to this kind of like blurring of boundaries. And, and that's like a perfect example of that where it's not the outside, but now it's the inside. So they, they, they have a body dysmorphic view of themselves. And that now is being projected onto the way that they view other things. And, and if you don't, I know, I know that in terms of facial recognition, um, disfigured, uh, disfigured faces, they actually grab attention more. So you are, they're more salient. Uh, it's something that you're more drawn to pay attention to. So if you have body dysmorphic uh, disorder, it might be that, you know, your, the, what's salient to you is different than to other people. But without that sort of typical activation, it is, uh, I would imagine that it would be, uh, it would be more difficult to process that face. And if you can't process the face, then it's more difficult to have empathy. It's more difficult to uh, identify with, with somebody else. So when, um, you know, when they talk about uh, cartooning and you draw a smiley face, um, that's easy to process. You know, it's a circle, two dots and, and a semicircle, but it also is everybody, right? That, that one emoji covers everybody. But as soon as you add details to it, then it's specific. It gets more and more specific in terms of who the people are. So that ease of processing, you know, and that idea of being able to see yourself in that other person, if you lose that, it's, it's extremely isolating. And, and then, uh, you know, that has its own consequences. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question, but uh, Monica says that, um, okay, we'll see her. Uh, do you want to try or shall I read it? Is it okay now? I, I feel like for the past five minutes, it's been okay. So I'll just try it and if it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> We've already got the question written down there, uh, but maybe I can explain it better uh, now. Um, and, and also because of my poor internet connection, uh, maybe you've mentioned this already and I missed it somehow. Um, but I, I really didn't know about the Wendigo tradition until we started this series and one of the speakers mentioned it and I found it um, incredibly interesting. Um, because I find, uh, we tend to focus more on the United States in, in this series, but I find the Native American history of Canada um, really fascinating. And um, curiously, you've mentioned uh, the Wendigo in your presentation and I was wondering if if there is um, in any of the products, products that you're analyzing today that you've analyzed in the past, if uh, there's any reference to um, the return of the repressed or the colonized in North American history and North American Gothic products. Um, because uh, well, we, we've been seeing the Gothics uh, a subgenre, a mode that transports and that allows every culture to deal with its own um, uncanny presences. Um, and well, I was wondering, is it Gothic? Have we made it Gothic? Uh, what is the Gothic exactly? And I think the Gothic does not necessarily have to pertain to the West only, although we have um, targeted its beginning in the West, but I think every society has a way, a way to deal um, with, with this sort of things uh, through culture. So I was wondering if, if there is any, what's the particular role of the Wendigo in the series? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, and more in general, uh, have have you thought about in your presentations? Have you thought about the American idea of the, the return of the repressed? I'm I'm sure, like uh, in Southern Gothic, which Paula has analyzed, but she's left, uh, it's quite present. But I was also wondering if um, well, Tony Morrison is an African American author, so I was wondering about your presentations as well. Okay, so if I sort of pick up with the Wendigo thing, so the, I mean, the other thing I was aware of it from as a, you know, kind of white British viewer of stuff is, um, is the, there's, you know, kind of streams of, of the Wendigo in, in Supernatural, which I know that we've got a few episodes that focus on that. In terms of, it's interesting with Hannibal because um, I, as far as I can remember, it doesn't get referred to as the Wendigo in the text itself it's referred to i think in the scripts although i'd have to double check that but certainly in the kind of fan um kind of uh, community although i think that comes from brian fuller because he's you know a producer you kind know, of creator who's been really interactive with the with the online fandom and the discussions around it um 
in terms of whether or not the Wendigo is it intrinsically gothic, I don't feel that I'm in a position to make that judgment. Um, but I certainly think that as a, you know, kind of you can see it as, or the use of the Wendigo in Hannibal as um, something that reflects, you know, the kind of, you know, white colonial or post-colonial kind of identity of, you know, kind of mining, um, you know, culture around them and using that to other, um, you know, within a, a horror text, definitely. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not sure if it, it, you know, kind of in in itself. I don't know enough about the Wendigo to, be able to say that it is kind of gothic in in its own terms. But certainly, it's you know, arguable cultural appropriation within Hannibal to use that as a term um, to describe it. Um, although I can understand, you know, as, as I said in, in in the presentation, I can understand why it would be a, a, a term that would be used within the world of Hannibal because of its connection to cannibalism. Thank you. Very interesting. I've not watched the series, but I got immediately interested in it. So uh, I'm going to watch it. Thank you very much for introducing that to us. And and yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's yeah, it's very interesting to analyze across cultural connections in in these terms. I don't know if anyone else wants to add something or I'll just um, um, put on down my camera. And thank you all for your presentations again. I would say, uh, you know, a couple of the the images that you picked uh, for Ravenstag and and when when Will gets the the uh, yeah. deer yeah. exactly uh, it made me think and, and it's probably not because I mean there's deer mythology everywhere uh, but it did make make me think uh, a bit of uh, the Mexican tradition of uh, the deer god that is something that you encounter and sort of chase mm -hmm. and chase and chase and it, it sort of disappears and then you see it again so it, it just made me think about it because yeah, i think will's uh development of the character uh, throughout the series is quite it seems that he's constantly chasing something in a way i mean i don't know if he's chasing his true self or if he's trying to find himself, if he's trying to, I don't know, um, as you say, somehow have this sort of fusion with mm -hmm. some parts of, of Lecter's personality, um, if, he's, if he's fascinated, but at the same time, of course, he's repulsed by this person. So it just made me, made me think about that. Yeah, that's really. I mean, it's really interesting. I wasn't aware of of, of the kind of dear god as as you know. Um, as I said, the kind of scope of the work is it is it exists in the mo at the moment is very much kind of focused on the idea that this is a you know kind of a, a white Western text and it's using those you know associations primarily. Um, but yeah, the, the whole Ravenstag thing as well, again, because of just the constraints of this, I've had to kind of draw some very kind of broad, broad strokes. But there are moments later on particularly kind of towards the end of season two where you see uh will have a very different relationship with the raven sag where he started starts to become more of an agent of his than you know kind of representation of hannibal um and using it to kind of you know in some way symbolically destroy hannibal or enact these fantasies of destruction um so yeah i mean it, it's uh, i think in the way that i sort of initially can sort of read it was just about the idea of you know it's a it's because of the you know kind of biology of the antlers is it something that it that seems to be intrinsically masculine about kind of masculine power mm -hmm. dominance and you know kind of display um particularly but yes thank you for yeah, bringing yeah. i imagine there's there's uh, of course as you were saying as there's this uh, monstrosity as predatory uh impulse or or something like that of course i guess the deer antlers are anyway uh a symbol of hunt, hunting, mm. uh, a sort of hunt, hunting, and that's usually masculine, uh, yeah. of, of course. And I think the other two texts, I um, I don't know, Batman is quite a white comic, isn't it? Uh, there's, there's not really uh, ethnic nor uh, <laughs> elements of, uh, I mean, uh, what, what 
is there anything if you can think of that connects to some diversity in that sense um so I mean, from Montoya, it, that's that's the the one character yeah. I can think of. I mean, yeah, it, it would have to either be Batman's allies or his rogues gallery. I mean, um, you do have Bane, who is of um, Hispanic descent, and then there's uh, Barbara Gordon, who uh, for a time uh, was uh, disabled in a wheelchair. Um, but yeah, I mean, they they come out of the the tradition of. Um, you know, they come out of the 1930s where you would, you know, you just did not um, have stories about uh, anybody but, um, you know, white males. I mean, I think even like Wonder Woman as a superhero was um, not not completely revolutionary because they did have prior golden age female superheroes, but um, many of the longest running um, comics that featured a female protagonist were uh, fashion comics or romance comics mm -hmm. rather than superhero comics. So it, it, is a, it is a product of its time, definitely. But um, yeah, it, you'd have to go to his rogues gallery or his, uh, his um, uh, allies for um, that type I, of- I think, not, not that you name her, uh, I think it's interesting how Barbara Gordon uh, was disabled for a time. I mean, there's there's this moment in which she's she's disabled, and uh, and there is a little bit uh, of ambivalence and and duality, uh, as uh, just to connect to to Farah's uh, reasoning, uh, because she's disabled, but she's oracle. You know, she's she's the person that somehow um, enables. That somehow. Uh, makes it possible, coordinates, I don't know how to say it, but uh, she's both things at the same time. So I, I think that's, that's kind of interesting uh, that they, they chose to, to, I don't know, uh, I, I don't know if they wanted to compensate to the fact that, that she was uh, left uh, disabled by uh, the, the whole, uh, Joker thing, or um, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, to to that last point about compensating, I actually think they they did a great job of not compensating for for her disability because at least in in superhero comics, there is that tendency of if you're disabled, you need you need something else. And and mm -hmm. the classic example is is Daredevil. Um, he's not. I mean, he's blind, but now he has this super you know radar super, sense. So. Yeah. You see it. You see it oftentimes in in popular culture as well. Um, the classic uh, example would be Rain Man, where you know he has uh, mental challenges, but we we need to give him something. Like he's he's a math savant. So um, I actually think uh, they did a pretty good job of not overcompensating. I'm sure it's compensating a little bit. I don't know too much of the history of. Uh, Batgirl, other than she's a librarian, so she would know how to organize things. <laughs> she, she could do uh, archives. Like uh, it, it makes, I think it makes sense for her to to kind of morph into that role, and and um, you know, I'm glad that they didn't give her. So I don't super... know. They, they didn't give her Bane's venom in order to give her like pumped up powers now, and she can she can walk and all that. So I don't know. I mean, the the idea of. Um, uh, disability, and then the the vampire elements in the um, sorry, I forgot the title in the Luella Miller story. I mean, Farrah, can you speak to that? I mean, is that a kind of do you see that as like a compensating aspect of it, like, or is it is it not uh, not along those lines? What what do you think? I think the kind of tendency of the scholarship up till now for that story has been that it's a a very subtle vampire story um and for me that was a very surface level observation because you have this very obvious theme of the the, the caregiver in terms of compensating i'm just thinking that there's a very good paper in there somewhere because this there's this idea that um, as a disabled person you have to be productive in some way to be valid and if you're not then your life isn't really worth taking care of so there, there might be an interesting paper in there about how like comics do that, and and in a, in a way it becomes um, 
there's the term inspiration porn about how um, disabled people are just there to inspire abled people to like get off their butt and, and do something because the, the lesser person can do it. Um, so I didn't really look at the, it in that way, but I looked at it. Um, it it's re a really interesting story because with Luella Miller, you have this narrator that has this very kind of concrete way of looking at things, but there are uh, even more ways of looking at it other than like vampirism, disability, there's, um, it, it's, I like it for that because there's no kind of concrete analysis of, of what it's saying. So. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is uh, very interesting and probably would require a whole different channel to talk about how uh, disability has been represented and I think what you were saying is very interesting and it does connect to, to what we were saying about comics that you really have to you always have this idea that if the disabled person can do it why can't you not you know and and it's somehow I think I always feel this somehow it erases uh, the normality of this person you know it's like you are uh, if you're depressed yeah it's because you're disabled and uh, but you should be you, you should be productive as you say and you should be an example because you have to be strong and you have to be and uh, i think this this idea of uh, a disabled person as a particularly strong person uh morally intellectually and so forth i think to me, at least, as a, I, I work uh, with ethnic studies, it, it does have a similar flavor as the idea that indigenous people are more pure or they are, you know, they have some kind of special uh, disposition uh, to be uh, these uh, spiritual people, you know, which, which is not so. I mean, uh, we're all the same and the fact that uh, you might have indeed a more spiritual connection or not, and that doesn't make you a lesser indigenous, just as being not always strong doesn't make you a lesser disabled people, you know. So I, I thought that that uh, was very interesting, what you were saying, and, and also these, uh, this thing that she's, she's uh, somehow sucking the life out of her caregivers it's quite interesting and i think it's i don't know it's probably very complex uh, from your analysis i understand that that this uh uh piece of fiction is very complex because uh of course there are so many layers in that and and guilt and uh, caregiving and love and affection and everything that comes into play that it's very complicated in real life. So, <laughs> so uh, I think if the public doesn't have any more questions, do you have any more comments for each other? Or shall we close it here? Well, other than uh, awesome job to my fellow panelists, and I now have uh, new avenues that I'm going to have to dive into <laughs> to, to further my work, but. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was an honor being here and being a part of this. I'd, I'd like to echo that. It's been uh, an absolute delight. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank I think you, so you really could uh, speak to each other, even if the texts were so different. I think they were very different texts and, and very different approach, approaches because your uh, ego is, is very specific, but still it could somehow connect to, to the other ones. So I thank you very much for being here today. And I thank our public as well. Some of them will know, some of them will see again. So thank you. Thank you.